Hello and welcome back to the channel. As always, man, it is so good to see you again. Uh, if you watched a couple of my most recent videos, you know that I've been kind of ranking on a tier list some of the post-human species from a couple of works of speculative evolution. Uh, one of those being All Tomorrows and one of those being Man After Man. Uh, both are fantastic and they're pretty different, but at the same time, they both cover similar um, content. So I thought it'd be interesting to compare some of the similar species that you see in both places. Now, of course, they are both um, very different in terms of our style, narrative, and their overall outlook, but uh, there are some species that are similar to each other across both. And so I kind of pulled those out, at least, um, some of the ones that I thought were most similar or at least covered similar concepts and so that's what we're gonna do today we're just gonna look at them and see what they're like when you you look at them side by side uh, now of course they're both amazing but they do serve different ideological purposes I guess you could say and so before we get to the actual species and feel free to skip ahead if this part isn't interesting to you I know how it is okay but I do want to talk about some of the differences between um, the style, narrative, the artwork. Now, of course, as I mentioned before, they are very different. All Tomorrow's is much more succinct and linear in its storytelling, whereas Man After Man is much more fragmented, and it's kind of split up in a few ways that make it sometimes just a little bit difficult to follow, at least if you're trying to pull out information like I do for these videos. Um, so All Tomorrow's is more of an overview and takes place on a galactic scale rather than only on Earth like Man After Man does. But again, not, not one's not necessarily better than the other, they're just different. Uh, however, Man After Man has these kind of specific vignettes that detail daily lives for several of the creatures described. Uh, it's almost like a documentary, and that helps make things much more real. Also, the way that these creatures evolve is quite a bit different. Uh, Man After Man has most species designed to fill ecological niches, uh, by their creators with the hopes of rebuilding Earth's environment, whereas All Tomorrows has them designed out of pure experimentation, or worse, out of spite. Um, in Man After Man, I, I do like the way that uh, future evolutions for these creatures are foreshadowed at, as behaviors that arise throughout the story, so those little uh, vignettes that we get do foreshadow, they serve a purpose, which is kind of cool. But if we wanted to boil it down, really, uh, the bottom line is that Man After Man has a much broader documentary style that feels somewhat grounded, despite its sometimes ridiculous subject matter. Uh, All Tomorrow's, on the other hand, keeps its artwork at the forefront, linking each image together with a tighter and much more disturbing, to be honest, uh, story. More is left to our imagination, which only adds to the intrinsic horror. Uh, which is inevitable with these types of things. So if we if we really come down to it, we could say that Man After Man is more like a biology textbook, whereas All Tomorrow's is more like science fiction. And interestingly, the artwork reflects this quite a bit as well. And that's our next section, the artwork. There is a very clear difference in the art style between the two. Um, as with the writing, which we just mentioned, Man After Man's artwork has a real textbook feel. Uh, there are vibrant colors, and the species have more natural poses, as if they're grazing or something like that. Um, still, the fact that some of these very, very odd creatures still have fully human faces is a bit disturbing on a, a very deep level, I'll just say it. Uh, with All Tomorrow's, though, the, the art is much more stylized. Um, they have kind of dreamlike sepia tones and exaggerated features. Uh, all of this only adds to the kind of uncanny feel, and to me that makes them a lot more disturbing. I don't know, it's, it's hard to put my finger on it, but even in the world of the story, with All Tomorrows, you can almost tell that the drawings are a bit distorted, as if they were um, reconstructed from memory rather than a direct observation, which is the vibe that Man After Man has, is that direct observation. So, I mean, we're not really comparing, uh, we're not really um, announcing a winner between the two because they're so different, but if I were to base it purely on the artwork, I have to give it to All Tomorrows, even though they are very disturbing. Still, they are works of, of real art. Um, not that the other isn't, but I don't want to get too in the weeds there, so. And then finally, both books do, are very different in terms of their overall outlook. Um, despite the extra horror that you find in All Tomorrows, based on the reasons we just mentioned, uh, and the fact that by the end of the book, no type of human exists any longer, uh, the ending is surprisingly hopeful. Uh, it encourages readers to make the most of their time and to change their world for the better. On the other hand, there's almost a clinical uh, vibe in Man After Man. It makes it a bit brighter while you're reading it and a little more pleasant, uh, but it ends on almost a more depressing note. It's almost like uh, the end, the, these extinctions are inevitable and there's just no way around it. And so for that reason, overall, Man After Man avoids having a thesis or a message entirely other than just to educate. 
whereas All Tomorrow is an almost philosophical uh, work. So, you know, they're just really different, but they're both super interesting, uh, but that does make them very difficult to compare to each other. So now we've kind of gone over some of the basics between the two that I think is most interesting. And so let's, you know what, let's talk about the species that are similar. I do want to point out that there's almost always more detail in Man After Man since it is textbook-like. Um, so there are some details I may have to infer for some species from All Tomorrows, and sometimes vice versa, um, just based on which species they are. So I also want to point out that there won't be an overall winner since the two works are just too different and they have too many species that can't be directly compared. Um, I only picked out the ones that have equivalents and some just don't, which is fine. For example, uh, Man After Man has no flyers or uh, any intelligent minds trapped in useless flesh like the colonials in All Tomorrows. None of that. All Tomorrows also has no cold weather species with a lot of fur for um, keeping warm. And All Tomorrows also has a bunch of these one-off species or like ones that are used for decoration like the Temptors uh, or the Subjects. Whereas Man After Man only has three of these and even then they only served a specific purpose and that's towards the end. Um, everything else arose out of natural biology or at least was designed to do that. So we're only comparing the ones that are most similar. So okay, we got all that out of the way, let's just get right to it. Let's start with the aquatics, the aquamorphs from Man After Man and the swimmers from All Tomorrows, which eventually evolve into the tool breeders. The aquamorphs are similar, but there's really no contest here. They can't reproduce. They can go on land, but they don't enjoy going on land, which is a cool um, kind of amphibious aspect of who they are. Uh, but they're again, they can't reproduce, so they can't really be compared to anything else because they die out uh, if there's no human there to genetically modify another one. So we'll move on to the aquatics, still from Man After Man. They're very odd looking. I love the way one other YouTuber puts it, which is they have resting fish face. But at least they don't have this weird nose, which is what the swimmers have, and that always freaks me out. I had a comment that pointed out that noses on these creatures is what really lends to this uncanny feel that I don't like. But it's still... That's part of what All Tomorrow's is, is, is that's the artwork, okay? Um, also, the aquatics from Man After Man can go on land, and they've developed a complex language. The aquatics um, designed a bubble of seawater that surrounds them. It's made out of uh, filamentous algae, and that's pretty cool, but it allows them to move onto land. They're really unwieldy on land, though. By the end of the, of the story, the aquatics had begun to overpopulate the ocean and ran, were running out of food, um, and that was a real problem for them. Eventually, they learned to farm algae in the ocean, and um, that's what gave them the great comeback and they, they thrived for a while until some, uh, let's just say, descendants of humanity came back from gallivanting around the universe and destroyed them. But let's not get into spoiler territory here, even though that was a direct spoiler, sorry. Still, that's as far as the aquatics ever got. They just started farming algae, which is great. But the swimmers, on the other hand, which were uh, adapted similarly, they became the tool breeders, and they eventually formed underwater cities. They bred whatever tools they needed. They made TVs out of color-changing skin for, for some of their creatures. They uh, like harpoons. They had uh, ways to breathe underwater, which they couldn't do. Uh, that's an advantage the aquatic had. It had gills. It could, it could breathe underwater. But the tool breeders actually figured it out. They were in, ingenious in that regard. Uh, that's a pretty big difference. So because the swimmers were smarter and they fashioned the world around them to become what they needed it to be rather than just dying out every time they ran out of food, the swimmers win. Next we have the insectophagi and the antmen. Uh, these are quite different despite having a very similar common ancestor in both works. They are both adapted to eat insects. The antmen are bred to eat specifically ants, of course, much like an anteater here on our regular old planet Earth, whereas the insectophagi, I believe, eat any insects and even small creatures. Uh, but they do have very different adaptations for that diet. With the antmen, you have these hands that are, they don't have nerves in them in a way that allow them to feel pain, so if they get bitten by the ants, no problem. Uh, they also have this very striking coloration, these very long, long fingers, which with one being quite a bit longer to reach in those little holes and get those ants out of there. Uh, and they have bad tasting meat, which deters predators. It's very interesting. Uh, whenever an ant bites them, their body repurposes the venom uh, rather than producing a reaction. It integrates them into the cells and it makes their meat taste terrible. So predators avoid them. Uh, that's a pretty cool adaptation and it arose completely naturally. Whereas the insectophagi, they do have some adaptations as well, but not nearly as much detail is given. They have a very long tongue. Uh, they have these long fingers as well. And I guess they use the tongue primarily for getting those bugs out. 
Uh, one thing that they have are these really leathery faces, especially around their jaws, that become a protection against the bugs if they were to get on their face, which makes sense. So that's cool. Interestingly enough, the ant men start to look like ants uh, in their shape, and the insectophagi eventually become the bug facers, and they also look very much like ants, although they're still people. Not ants, uh, just, just bugs in general. That's why they're called the bug facers. If if that makes sense. The ant men, on the other hand, are much more like animals. Uh, they remain primate level intelligence, and the insectophagi eventually become the bug facers, as I mentioned, which are very intelligent, much like humans. So in that regard, they're pretty different, but I gotta say, looking at them, the insectophagi are much creepier, but I gotta say, based on my personal preference and only that, I'm gonna give it to the ant men. And you know what? It's my video, so I can do whatever I want. Next, we're moving on to the Predator from All Tomorrows and the Desert Runner slash Spike Tooth from Man After Man. I had to kind of pick two from Man After Man because they're both similar in that way. In All Tomorrows, the big carnivore is, of course, the Predator. But I will say that you have the Desert Runner, which is carnivorous, and it runs across the desert, and it's it's pretty creepy. Imagine this just leaping out at you and grabbing you. No, thank you. But the Spike Tooth is probably the best analog to the Predator in All Tomorrows, so that's what we're actually going to use for this comparison. I just wanted to point that out. Both the Spike Tooth from Man After Man and the Predator from All Tomorrows have giant teeth, perfect for ripping into their prey. They're both stocky and heavy, uh, very efficient hunters, and their mouths open very wide. Let's just say I wouldn't want to get chased by any of them because I would not last very long. <laughs> uh, in All Tomorrows, it's kind of interesting because their prey is bred for them specifically by the Q, which genetically modified all of them. Um, they put them on a planet where there were distinct predators and there were distinct prey. Whereas in Man After Man, the prey that the spike tooth, you know, prey on, uh, they evolved naturally. Um, so I think, think that's interesting. Overall, I gotta say, uh, especially because the predators from All Tomorrows evolve into these more refined hunter folk, which retain their scary appearance but become much more refined. And so... Overall, I gotta give this one to Predators and the Hunter Folk. Even though I love the Spike Tooth, they have a special place in my heart forever. It's it's the Hunter Folk that really pushed it over the edge for me. Next up, we have the Parasite and Host from All Tomorrows and the Parasite and Host from Man After Man. That's right, these are directly analogous to each other, although they are still quite a bit different. Uh, in All Tomorrows, of course, they were modified directly and uh, placed on a planet with a parasite and a specific host, just like the predators and prey were, uh, whereas in Man After Man, both evolved naturally from two separate uh, lineages, if you will. In Man After Man, the parasites are they're basically just small primates that live on blood, um, and they have these grasping hands to grab onto these big folds of fat that their hosts have, and uh, they just bite into them with these specialized teeth. And so there's only one, uh, type and their hosts are blubbery and dim-witted beings and they have a big supply of blood because they have a big supply of fat whereas in All Tomorrows, you have a bunch of different types of parasites being bred uh, that do different things. Some evolve to suck blood, just like normal, like a leech or something, and others evolved to enter their host's reproductive tract or something like that, and they end up killing their hosts. So they have all these different ones, and the ones that came out on top were the ones that, um, you know, didn't kill their hosts, which makes sense, uh, and they evolved in a way that they were adapted to one specific type of host, and some provided their host with different advantages, like better eyesight or different senses and stuff like that. Now, in All Tomorrows, eventually the parasites evolve uh, with their host to become much more uh, symbiotic, or at least on the symbiotic side of the spectrum. But in Man After Man, there no such thing happens. These little parasites just jump onto these poor hosts and they just live there. And the hosts just wander around, not even paying them much attention, but they're still independent of each other in that regard. It's a parasitic relationship, in other words, and it stays that way until they die out. We'll come back to the host and parasite from All Tomorrows because they evolve into something different, and we'll compare that to a different species in Man After Man, but for now, I'm just gonna give these guys a tie because they're too similar at the moment. Next, we have the Blind Folk from All Tomorrows and the Cave Dweller from Man After Man. Now, this one is kind of tough to compare directly because while they both dwell underground or in caves, Man After Man gives virtually no details on these besides a very brief story where they're mentioned, and there's not even a drawing to show you. Uh, so I made this drawing for a previous video. You can check it out. But since I don't know what they look like, they are cloaked in shadow. 
Uh, the blind folk from All Tomorrows are very adapted to life underground. They have these huge ears, they don't have any eyes or skin pigment, and they uh, move around listening with these ears for the creatures that hunt them, uh, which use echolocation. So that's kind of their way of getting an advance warning. I do say, I, I will say, despite the lack of information given in All Tomorrows, I do like the fact that there's this mystery that surrounds the cave dwellers. Uh, and it plays out in another story involving another species called the Travelers, which is it's very intriguing and, and disturbing, even though it's very short. But unfortunately, that's not enough to win this head-to-head -head battle between the two. So, sorry, but based on information, the Blind Folk win by default. Unfortunately, the Blind Folk do die out due to shifting tectonic plates, and the Cave Dwellers die out with no information given as to why. So, there's that. Next, we have the Finger Fishers from All Tomorrows versus the Fish Eaters from Man After Man. In Man After Man, there are basically two analogous species that we could compare to the Finger Fishers from All Tomorrows, so I'll do both. This is the first one, which is the Fish Eater. Finger Fishers fish in much different ways than the Fish Eaters from Man After Man. They use a very long finger, almost like a hook and they have very very small and sharp teeth and a lot of them stuck in their jaw. It seems that the finger fishers are more designed to wade between islands rather than diving after the fish which makes sense. They live on a planet that has a lot of shallow oceans between many islands so they just wade in around. The fish eaters on the other hand from Man After Man have some very cool adaptations that are described in more detail like they have polarized lenses in their eyes which allows them to see through the water even if it's a super bright day and really cool they have a brain that compensates for refraction so if they see a fish in the water they know exactly where to put their hand to get it and they won't miss. Uh, they also have a very streamlined, elongated body. So they're designed to get in the water and go after the fish or, or very close to the water's edge. Uh, but I gotta say, between the two, as far as abs go, it definitely goes to the finger fisher. But as far as hunting fish goes, which is kind of the, the whole idea, my money's on the fish eaters. So for that reason, sorry guys, the fish eaters win. Now remember the old parasites I mentioned from All Tomorrows? Well, here's where they come back into play. Uh, so we're going to compare now the symbiotes and the symbionts from Man After Man. Uh, eventually the parasites become the symbiotes in All Tomorrows, which is where this comparison comes in. In All Tomorrows you have one species, which are the former parasites, called the symbiotes, which directly control their hosts by living on their heads. Uh, the hosts then are used like cars. They even switch them out for different uses, like if a parasite is leaving the house for a business trip, he'll take one uh, host. If he's coming home to relax and he just wants to kick back, he'll choose another host. So that's just the way they, they trade them out. They're like cars. The symbionts, on the other hand, in Man After Man, they're two coexisting species that live and, and benefit from each other. Definitely more of a symbiotic relationship as I imagine it. They're now called the hunter and the carrier. The carriers literally carry the hunters, that makes sense. Where And the carriers also provide the hunters with warmth because they live in cold climates, whereas the hunters provide a much superior intelligence uh, for guiding them and also food. At first, the uh, hunters just direct the carriers by pointing where they want to go, but uh, as they evolve, the relationship becomes much more like a horse and rider, and they communicate telepathically. And they, just, they, they develop this very strong uh, an almost loving bond, to be honest with you. It's very precious uh, to read about. There is a story where they have to fight each other, so uh, two symbionts are fighting each other, and it's more of a display of show more than anything. But one of them does die, and it's very sad because they, they really do like each other, and so they have this strong bond between each other. Whereas in All Tomorrows, you have basically... It's, al it's still almost a parasite that lives on the host. Even though the parasite is no longer hurting the host, it's just not quite the same as that special bond. So for that reason, the symbionts win. Sorry that they had to go extinct uh, due to a change in climate. Next, we have a comparison. This one's kind of a stretch, but I'm only comparing them because they're, they're both gentle giants. We have the Titan from All Tomorrows and the Sloth Men from uh, Man After Man. So it's not quite a direct comparison. The Titan from All Tomorrows is much, much larger, and it kind of has this modified lower lip, which is like a trunk of an elephant. Still, despite the fact that they are very different sizes, the Sloth Men in the world of Man After Man is one of the biggest creatures on land, if not the biggest. They, they just seem pleasant to be around. They both seem happy. They're basically 
they're like an elephant and a giant sloth, so who wouldn't want to check those guys out? They also both went extinct under tragic circumstances. The Titans were killed by an Ice Age when they were just redeveloping sentience, or uh, uh, sapience, sorry, I had to be very careful, and the sloth men were killed out by predators, basically. Still, I gotta say, the fact that the Titans are so huge, I believe the book says they were 40 meters, that makes them pretty cool, so the Titans win this round. And never forget to remember the Titans. Next we have the Islander versus the Finger Fisher. So this is the other Finger Fisher comparison I mentioned was coming up. Uh, interestingly, the Islanders are the ancestors of the Parasites from Man After Man, which I mentioned before. In both stories, both the Finger Fishers and the Islanders are post-humans forced to adapt to island life. But they did this in extremely different ways. The Islanders from Man After Man just were kind of trapped by rising waters after climate change, and so they were just spread out amongst these islands. And in fact, one group from the Islanders split off and left uh, in a boat that they had made. Uh, that's, a, that's a story for another time. The Islanders from Man After Man are small, and they're adapted to a scarce, though very high-protein diet. So to adapt to that, they just became smaller. Uh, the finger fishers, as we've discussed, they reach into the water, and they do seem more adapted to island life um, to me, based on those long fingers and and fish-like teeth, and that makes more sense because they were specifically engineered to live on the islands rather than just getting trapped there, essentially. Uh, so for that reason, the finger fishers win, plus the parasites that the islanders turn into. That's kind of kind of creeping me out. So next we have the plains dweller and the mantelope. These species are very different, uh, but because they both eat grass, I figured I might as well compare them. Of course, the plains dweller, which is from Man After Man, is actually still humanoid. It's got, uh, you know, two legs, two arms, stands upright, and all this different stuff. Whereas the mantelope from All Tomorrow's, it looks like an antelope. That makes sense. The plains dweller uh, from Man After Man has a, has a ruminating gut, as, as the text puts it, and grinding teeth to get those plants down. And I assume the mantelope has the same. If it's going to be eating grass, it needs that. And the one big difference is that the plains dweller has a, a muted intelligence done on purpose, and the mantelope retains its full human intelligence, which is part of the tragedy of their story. They're trapped in these antelope-like bodies and are unable to build or be creative in ways that humanity needs, and they can't even talk, so that's a real problem. The Plains Dweller has one really cool adaptation, which was genetically engineered. They have a blade, essentially, on their pinky and on their the side of their hand, which is made from a calloused skin, and they can slice right through plants and eat them. And I gotta tell you, that's pretty cool. Once they start evolving a little bit more, that blade becomes even more pronounced, and they can use it to attack each other and cut off each other's heads, which is actually described in the book very, very cool in my opinion. Uh, the mantelope story is a sad one, but I gotta give it to the plains dweller, so that's where it's gonna go. Next we have the spacers from All Tomorrows and the vacuumorphs from Good Old Man After Man. Now I picked these two species, even though they're very different, but just because they both live in zero gravity. Um, however, their evolution could not be more different. The vacuum morphs from Man After Man were designed almost from scratch with flesh and organs grafted on, and so they couldn't even reproduce. They were only based on human cells, and they only exist because of humans doing them one by one. The spacers, on the other hand, evolved naturally, and they have long, spindly limbs and big brains. They're, they're still a lot like humans, even though they look pretty weird. The vacuum morphs were designed by humans for one purpose, to help dock and repair spaceship in Earth's orbit. So they are designed for a lower gravity. They don't need a strong spine or um, like palms on their hands to be able to hold things. They just need to grasp. The spacers evolved the way they did because when the Q invaded, and these were the bad guys of all tomorrows, they retreated into space and lived in hollowed out asteroids to evade them. And uh, you know what? It worked. The spacers eventually became godlike and they achieved an intelligence that you and I couldn't even imagine. Whereas the vacuum morphs, well, they died out quickly because they can't reproduce. Uh, the vacuum morphs had four lungs and two were for breathing normally. One was for holding excess uh, air in case they needed some extra and the other one they could expel air from which would now allow them to navigate in zero gravity if necessary. Whereas the spacers had something similar but they actually used gas from a modified anus. So even still with their superior intelligence which comes later i gotta give it to the spacers spacers win plus you don't want to tick them off uh, they could mess you up 
Lastly, we have the high tech versus the gravitol. So the high tech being from man after man and the gravitol being from all tomorrows. This one's definitely a stretch, uh, but they both involve mechanical bodies. So here we are. Uh, the gravitols are a result. Basically, this arrogant race, they, they were called the Ruin Haunters, which is an awesome name. Uh, they transcended the need for their flesh and implanted their consciousness into these elegant and really cool looking machines. Uh, the high tech were basically machines that they encased living human bodies in order to keep them alive. Uh, so that, that was their purpose. Uh, the gravitals became genocidal and eventually wiped out almost all of humanity's descendants, whereas the high tech replaced their machine bodies with flesh again, um, going back to the old ways, and they became lumpy and disturbing abominations called the tick, who eventually ran out of food and they died out. So let's just say one is a perfect killing machine with an intelligence that rivaled the godlike spacers, and one is a petty body horror obsessed with fashion. So winner gravitals on that one. And with that, we've reached the end of the list of species that I feel can be at least somewhat directly compared. Uh, if there are any I missed, be sure to let me know in the comments because this is such an interesting conversation to have. These two works, while vastly different, still scratch that uh, uncanny itch in our brain to see what the future could look like, even if it is fictional. So if you enjoyed this video, leave me a like, it helps me out a lot, and thanks for watching. I will see you in the next one.